Here we're going to talk about the uh, different types of inspection that you're going to involve in as an aircraft inspector. We're going to talk about general visual inspection, detailed visual inspection and special inspection. We're also going to understand what we mean by a special general visual inspection and where that came about. So we have uh, a list of inspections here. Let's start at the top. Uh, visual inspection, uh, general visual inspection, detailed visual inspection, special visual inspection, and then we have the EWIS standalone general visual inspection. And we're going to understand what each one uh, actually means. So, uh, visual inspection. It's looking at the aircraft, but from a proximate distance means I could uh, stand on the ground and I could do a visual inspection, uh, looking at the wings, looking at the stabilizer, looking at the fin. Uh, this is a visual inspection. Uh, of course, I'm, I'm looking for anomalies. I'm looking for things that are not correct, uh, but it's not uh, up close and personal, so to speak. And that's the big difference between the visual inspection and the general visual inspection. Because a general visual inspection is a very, very carefully thought out task. And we're gonna see that there is rules for the general visual inspection. Rules involving how close you need to be. Uh, and we're gonna talk about that in a minute. Uh, a detailed visual inspection. And often when the question is asked, what is the difference between a general visual inspection and a detailed visual inspection, uh, some people are a little bit hesitant, a little bit confused as to why there is this difference. Uh, do you look harder? Do you look longer? No, of course not. Uh, what in actual fact, the reason it's detailed is because we have to do something else before we are able to do the inspection. So a general visual inspection is typically the opening of panels, uh, the opening of areas in order to facilitate the inspection. A detailed visual inspection is going to identify what else it is that we've got to do to, as a precursor, as an, an enabler, in order to perform the inspection and my answer when somebody says so what is a de what makes this a detailed visual inspection uh, I, I answer I, I don't know until I actually read the specifics of the task and then I can understand why this particular task is a detailed visual inspection but you cannot just say perform a detailed visual inspection of such and such because it's not how it works uh, to perform a general visual inspection absolutely I can perform a general inspection of the undercarriage bay no problem this is the standard form of zonal inspection but you can't give me a task to uh, perform a detailed visual inspection of the undercarriage compartment unless you then follow up and say with such and such, such and such, such and such removed. Now, of course I can, because that's what's made it a detailed inspection. Uh, special inspection is when we're talking about uh, NDT techniques, for example, uh, radiographic, uh, magnetic particle, eddy current, uh, ultrasound, all these different, even uh, uh, die penetrant. Uh, all of these are uh, considered as uh, special visual inspection uh, processes, techniques. And then we talk about uh, EWIS, standalone general visual inspection. So what makes an EWIS standalone general visual inspection? There are not so many of them. This should be said. 
uh, but there are a number and we've got to treat them in a special way uh, and here's basically the rules uh, if I carry out a zonal inspection then if there is a standalone general visual inspection in the same zone during the same check another person should do it not me uh, why because this is human factors this is good human factors uh, recognizing that the standalone general visual inspection is there for a reason it's there because it's been analyzed that there is a potential for uh, uh, upset within the wiring systems to the point where uh, it's required to actually do an inspection only of the wiring so does that mean that we won't do an inspection of the wiring during the zone inspection of course we will it everything is included uh, but however at a certain point during the check uh, another person should then perform a separate inspection of the EWIS in accordance with the task card uh, think of it as a form an inspection form of critical task inspection and if you've got in your hand uh, a general visual inspection card and a standalone general visual inspection card for the same area you need to give one of them cards back you're doing something wrong and the planning guy that gave you that uh, actually should be reminded that this isn't how the system should work for best practice any more than I should be working uh, changing critical components on the left wing and the right wing at the same time uh, all of these uh, are basically safeguards human factor safeguards to ensure that we don't uh, how to say it raise the possibility of uh, incidents, accidents, events, etc. We minimize it as much as we can. 17. It's important that visual inspection methods are understood and properly applied. It's not something just to uh, rush through, sign up the cards, or even in my past, I've known people that would sign for things that they haven't done because they believe that that particular area is never a problem therefore this is not a problem therefore I will sign the cards and let's move on and do something else and this is very very dangerous it's it's almost playing Russian roulette uh, because one day there will be something wrong and uh, as I said earlier uh, we don't really want such people in our system uh, anybody that is happy to sign for th something they're not taking responsibility for, uh, it's not good. It, it, even it's it's really dangerous, and I, I hope you agree. Uh, so, personal action point. Uh, proficiency in visual inspection is crucial to the safe operation of the aircraft. Uh, why? Because that's how the aviation system works now. The aircraft is very safe, but it needs to be managed in a continuing airworthiness environment. And the aircraft inspector is a critical part of this process. So how do we get proficient? We become proficient in two ways. From our personal experience development, the development of our competence, and by learning from the experience and methodology employed by others. How do other people do it? And how effective are they in delivering what it is that they're doing? Uh, the people who are the best inspectors have a methodical step-by-step -step approach. They're able to focus and for a period of time, we've already spoke about this, for the 30 minutes that you are going to spend performing inspection, you put everything else out of your mind. Forget about what you've got to get from the shops. Forget about the kids, schooling issues. Forget about everything. Focus for 30 minutes on looking at this aeroplane. That's all you should be able to do. Focus 
methodically, step by step. And it's a challenge. It's a, it's a bit like trying to go to sleep when your head is buzzing with stuff and, and you just can't clear your head. It's the same type of arrangement, but this time we're not clearing our head to go to sleep. We're clearing our head to focus on the inspection tasks, the inspection activities. Uh, so we spoke already uh, at the very beginning, we spoke about the difference. And what it says here is the visual check is a failure finding task to be determined if an item is fulfilling its intended purpose. Uh, it can be performed from a distance. Conversely, a general visual inspection must be within touching distance. 72. Uh, what's meant by a qualitative inspection task? What's the difference between subjective and objective? How to ensure the effectiveness of subjective tasks. So, do you know the answer to this? Do you know what we mean by a qualitative inspection task? Uh, maybe not, so let's talk about it. So, we use the term quantitative and qualitative. And... In general, a qualitative inspection task is a one-off. If you were sitting at a desk uh, inspecting, let's say, a set of components, you had a hundred components, all the same, and you were performing inspections in accordance with an inspection checklist, what you would be doing would be termed a quantitative task. When you do a qualitative task, you're actually looking at a single or very, very small sample. So what's the difference between subjective and objective? Well, with subjective, you are determining whether something is okay or not. It's your decision. If you say it's not okay, then it is not okay. This is a subjective inspection. If you're doing an objective inspection, you're actually inspecting in accordance with a specific checklist. So if I'm sitting in the flight deck and I operate a switch and I expect to see a result Maybe I, I see a, a message on, on Ecamm, for example. So that is an objective task because I'm following a prescriptive guide. Why we make the difference? We make the difference because uh, with a subjective task, it is the understanding and opinion of the inspector that counts for everything. So how to ensure the effectiveness of a subjective task is how to ensure the inspector is competent to perform that task. Means that we've given the inspector the training, the knowledge, the information, everything that that inspector requires to be effective and perform a task using uh, his skill and understanding uh, this is how we can ensure the effectiveness of subjective tasks. And it's all down, ultimately, it's all down to the skill and competence of the inspector. So, uh, functional checks. 73. Functional checks are a quantitative check. We, we've just been talking about this. Uh, inspection is a qualitative task where the judgment is employed to determine the degree of finding. Uh, and that's what zonal inspections are. They are qualitative tasks. 
they do require the subjective interpretation to a large degree of the inspector. Uh, we talk about MSG. Uh, MSG, of course, as you know, I'm sure, stand for Maintenance Steering Group. And MSG3 is the current system of the Maintenance Steering Group that we use. This is, we were talking before about the Maintenance Review Board. And the Maintenance Review Board is working within the MSG3 rules. MSG3 has been around a long time. It was introduced in 1980. 40 years ago, very long time, it has changed and the last change which was uh, uh, completed 10 years ago was the introduction of EWIS inspection and something that's known as EZAP. Uh, EZAP is Enhanced Zonal Analysis Procedure and what happened during uh, an ESAP assessment is a zone is considered for its complexity of electrical wiring but also for the possibility that the zone can uh, accumulate uh, dirt, dust, debris, uh, contaminants, all of these uh, because previously we didn't have task cards related to zonal cleanliness. Following the introduction of EZAP in 2005, there was a, a transition through to uh, 2010 when all the maintenance uh, programs had to include reference to EZAP. Now uh, to touch on a, a general visual inspection. And as it says here, this level of inspection is made from within touching distance unless otherwise specified. Uh, that's a, a sort of a, a get out of jail free card because uh, I, I have personally not seen it otherwise specified. But they're protecting themselves because they can give some variation. Uh, a mirror may be necessary. To enhance visual access. If you're looking behind something, how else can you do it without a mirror? So a mirror is a pretty uh, relevant tool when you're doing uh, general visual inspection. Uh, we can also, we're going to go into it in more detail, but we're going to talk about the uh, lighting story. We're going to talk about the use of the uh, magnifying glass, the loop. But for now, that's uh, what we understand by general visual inspection. A detailed inspection, uh, an intensive examination of a specific item, installation or assembly to detect damage, failure or irregularity. Uh, available lighting normally supplemented. Uh, inspection aids such as mirrors, magnifying lenses may be necessary surface cleaning and elaborate access procedures may be required that that's the key uh, from my view uh, for the detailed inspection that we've got specific guidance and that we've probably got cleaning and uh, additional access procedures specific detailed inspection so we spoke about this and what we're talking about here is uh, an intensive examination, but we're using specialized inspection techniques. Uh, again, there's in, and we've already said the different uh, magnetic particle, uh, radiographic, uh, eddy current, and, and, and so on and so on. Uh, intricate cleaning, substantial access uh, may be required. Uh, now to touch on the uh, additional considerations related to electrical wiring. Uh, amongst the training requirements, it's necessary to make people aware of uh, 
EWIS, Electrical Wiring Interconnect Systems, which basically is, is, is a, an abbreviation that we use to reflect any electrical wiring. Any wiring, one wire on an aircraft is considered EWIS, uh, as is a loom, so it's a generic term. Uh, we need to understand that visual inspection of wiring comes with some limitations because uh, it's difficult to see small defects. Cracked insulation uh, cannot always be seen. Uh, but if we do have correct insulation, uh, then there is a potential uh, for deterioration of the wiring itself and at a certain point the wiring can actually fail. Uh, here's a personal action point related to uh, EWIS. EWIS maintenance practices should contain a protect clean as you go uh, housekeeping behavior philosophy. Uh, this requires to be taken to protect the wiring bundles and connectors during work and to ensure that all swarf shavings, debris and any other contaminants are cleaned up after the work is completed and before the wiring is uh, unprotected. So we protect the wiring, we perform the maintenance, we then clean the area and make sure it's 100% clean before we then unprotect the wiring uh, and return to its uh, normal configuration. Uh, a standalone general visual inspection, which is not performed as part of a zonal inspection, uh, even in cases where the interval coincides with a zonal inspection, the standalone GVI shall remain an independent step within the work card and if you do remember this please uh, as a takeaway uh, that just remember this that the same person who does the zonal inspection should not do the standalone general visual inspection of the electrical wiring uh, you might now turn around and say where is that written down and that's not how the regulations work. It, they don't make the laws like that. Uh, so are you breaking the regulations, breaking the law, if you were to stamp both the job card for the general visual inspection and the job card for the standalone visual inspection? And the answer is no. It's not about the regulatory requirements or the law. It's about best practice, human factors, common sense. And, and that's what you need to take away. So if I was the only person in the hangar that had the authority to sign a particular job card and there was nobody else there, would I delay an aircraft? Of course not. But what I would do is do the general visual inspection, take a break, have a coffee or whatever, come back, and do the standalone visual inspection very very carefully so it's about applying common sense but normally when we've got an aircraft in the hangar for several days that situation would never arise and we can absolutely arrange for another person to do the standalone general visual inspection So, here, here's a general question. Uh, how successful is aircraft maintenance zonal inspection in your organization? You can answer this for yourself. You will know. Uh, what are the implications if it's not performed correctly? And we spoke about this at the very, very beginning as an introduction, so not to repeat it again. But the reality check is that as aircraft maintenance engineers we work in a dynamic industry uh, which of course demands perfection our human errors can have disastrous results which is why we must take every possible precaution to ensure we perform our duties in a safe and effective way 
we've now got a list of 23 items and these are basically items that have been derived from uh, investigation reports where things have not gone correctly and the question is uh, how many of these do you identify with for each of the following reasons identified following feedback from multiple inspection feedback surveys so for each of the following please develop your own answer based on the following this will not happen in our organization because and then you write down the reason inspection documentation not available this will not happen in our organization because documentation not self-contained what does that mean it means all the information that you need is not together in one place documentation not well human engineered what does that mean it means that the documentation has not been written in a good way it's ambiguous it leaves you wondering what's going on and how to interpret documentation does not specify inspection strategy means that it's not clear what you actually have to do and then we look at some of the equipment things wrong or broken lighting used uh, even you know that the lighting isn't adequate you will make do and manage it'll be okay it often be okay is not okay uh, the task uh, hasn't been understood correctly and we actually looked in the wrong area or through the wrong access 82 uh, there, there was missing access equipment again we have workarounds we manage uh, inadequate access equipment it wasn't up to the job uh, inadequate body support during the task what does that mean well in order to see I'm having to reach over to the extreme of my uh, position I'm reaching it's extremely uncomfortable uh, but I believe that I can see what I need to see but because of the discomfort actually even without thinking about it I am taking a shortcut I am rushing the inspection because I'm not comfortable uh, poor posture for sim simultaneous manipulation and viewing what does that mean again my body's not in a good position and if it's not in a good position it I'm not in the best advantage uh, difficulty handling the light the mirror and the magnifier together therefore I'm not holding the light and therefore the light is maybe not in the best position uh, again due to a misunderstanding the wrong inspection uh, or the limits chosen are not correct uh, we haven't completely search the chosen area so we've got an incomplete search coverage that will never happen in our organization because uh, and you've got to consider the answers uh, 83 the field of vision or fixation incomplete due to time limitations I'm running out of time uh, and I haven't covered all the field of vision uh, fixation movement too far to ensure reliable inspection we're going to understand that if we're looking outside of our field of vision then we're not actually seeing in the way that we need to we are defocused outside of the field of vision and if we're relying on that to basically say that we've inspected of a particular area 
it's not okay. It's it's potentially a disconnect. Uh, loss of situation awareness uh, by area or field of vision. Uh, loss of situation awareness and coverage when finding additional stops the search process and we get disconnected. Uh, we fail to record a defect that we found. The location, uh, we've identified the location but we failed to record the type of defect. So how are we recording as we are proceeding? Where are we writing it down? Are we uh, verbally recording? Or are we writing it down? You choose, but whatever way you do it needs to be effective for you as the inspector. Uh, if there are additional comments uh, for the defect that uh, they are not recorded. Uh, defect location incorrectly recorded or defect type incorrectly recorded or defect comments incorrectly recorded these are all things that have happened this is not uh, you know how to say it uh, anticipating what could go wrong these have actually been demonstrated to have gone wrong for other people so it's something to uh, pay attention to.